When you're talking about dieting, there needs to be clear context about what we're talking about here. If you're just talking about losing some weight or fat loss, then the amount of restrictions that you may have to implement may not be that many, right? Like if you just need to get a calorie deficit, there may not be a whole lot of restrictions. The more extreme that you want to get with your fat loss, the more restrictions are going to come into place. And then the more fine details matter too. It really comes down to what you do and how you better Today we have Paul Corder and he will be with us today having a nice conversation about training, periodization, also providing a little bit of an insight of what his cheat meals are and what it's all about when it comes to introducing some extra calories in our diet some days uh, when we're dieting. What is linear versus undulating periodizations? What's the difference between warm-ups and actual working sets? I'm very excited to have you. I'm excited to be here with you. I've been looking forward to coming on and doing this with you for the last few weeks. We have the schedule, so. Oh, yes. Yeah, ready to get down to business. Well, I am going to ask you first to give me a little bit of your background. You've done so much things that I really want to hear it from you because coming from me, it's not very, very exciting. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, I started lifting uh, when I was 14 and um, pretty much hated it at first. And uh, I was actually living out in the Northwest part of the United States at the time for the summer. And uh, I had to lift weights because I was staying with my martial arts uh, instructor's parents and he made me lift with him and I absolutely hated it. And about a month in, I started seeing the, the changes happening to my body. And I was like, no, I think I'm gonna keep doing this. So that I've literally just never stopped since then. And it's probably been over the past eight or nine years that um, I started, uh, I literally started a blog and got discovered by some people out of the Elite FTS, the powerlifting website, and started writing articles for them. And it just really just blew up every year from there. And so here we sit. That's awesome. That's, and yeah, that's the condensed version there. Clearly, there's, there was a million things that happened between, um, between then and now that got us here. But uh, I know you have a lot of questions that you want to get to with this. So like I said, that's kind of the condensed version. Well, that's a really nice condensed version. But let me just ask you one more question. What led you, or like over so many things that you can choose to be in life, why did you choose to be where you are right now to do what you do? Wow. So, I, when, like I said, when I got it, I started lifting and, and I really started seeing my body change, it became um, such an enormous passion. Like the whole, the whole lifting, lifting thing and learning about how to, uh, the, all the different ways that you could influence your body, get to grow or lose fat or reshape it or whatever it is, that, that became such a huge passion uh, in my life. And I read everything that, at the time, uh, I read everything that you could find on anatomy and physiology and training and nutrition and those kind of things. I bought every book. I watched every video. If there was anything pertaining my weekends at the time when I was a teenager would be I'd go to the mall with my date or whatever and I would go to the bookstore and any books I didn't have I would always look for new books to buy and read and I, I was obsessed with it for so long and just like and teaching myself all these various different things and uh, when I went into the military uh, I actually went in to go into uh, high-speed operations was going to be pararescue or combat control that would have been in the Air Force but uh, I ended up being in computer operations for intelligence. And the neat thing is, is that well, I, I had strep throat the day that you're supposed, you're supposed to take the, um, the apti physical aptitude test to get into special operations. So what how it ended up all kind of combining into um, the mix of where I am now is uh, when I, I became a computer engineer uh, and then got out of the military, kept doing that. And then um, I started writing, wrote the blog and like I said, just ended up here. But this was such um, this was such a passion of mine from the time that I started, and it just has never went away. And I've been fortunate enough that I've met plenty of other people like that, that they discover and find this process, and it becomes such a huge passion in their life that it never wanes and never dies or anything like that. So it's been an evolution every year in my life in some way, form or the other, especially from you, and you should know this yourself, like you never stop learning, you never start edu stop educating, and you realize when you look back at the shit that you thought you knew two or three years ago, you're like, wow, it's like, I can't believe I believe that then. And then the stuff that you, you probably believe now may not be the same shit that you believe two or three years from now either. So that's just, that's the nature of the game. As long as you're not dogmatic and you're open-minded and you're willing to grow mm. and learn, you'll continue to get better. 
I think that's the most important thing that as a professional, as, as a human, we need to learn that everything is changing and this world is always evolving. And the more we are open to just be aware that things are going to change, even science is always moving forward and evolving I, I think that's so important because there's a lot of people that get stuck in one theory or one thing and they become very dogmatic about things and then they just become so close-minded that it's so hard with, with, for them to evolve as well. And yeah, what are you saying is really important to kind of actually take, be open about it, be aware that everything can be different and what we thought that would be sort of our Bible of thoughts few years ago, perhaps now things have changed and we can move, move on with those as well. Yeah, and one of my sayings is that uh, change, in, change is inevitable, but growth is optional. So the change is gonna happen anyway, and your degree that you're willing to move with it is uh, gonna come back to how flexible that you're willing to be in your, your approach to learning and your approach to believing the new data that comes out and stuff like that. So. Yeah, I try to make sure that I use appropriate words when I write about stuff because I'll say, based on the data that we have now, and that's a really important phrase to preface all of your writing with, is based upon the data that we have now. Uh, that's an important phrase to use. So otherwise, you, you, when you get stuck and people will say, well, you wrote or said whatever three years ago, and I'll be like, well, I've learned better since then. And that's supposed to be what we're, we're doing. That's supposed to be what we are doing. Absolutely. Well, let's get into some concepts that I really wanted to clarify with you because they can be very, you can find very different versions of these concepts, uh, especially when we think about advanced training techniques. I really wanted to talk to you about periodization, just defining what it is when it comes to training and uh, why is this implemented in the, in the first place? Why would you put it or periodize a training for an individual depending on whether they're beginner, intermediate, or advanced trainees. Um, and why is this about? Well, depending on the, the level of experience of the trainer is going to determine either whether they need periodization or what type of periodization is used. So for a true raw beginner, that's probably, you're probably not going to need um, to look at any high level form of periodization. So a beginner the byproduct, if we're talking in terms of pure hypertrophy, a beginner, the byproduct of the, of the, of the neuromuscular, the neuromuscular byproduct of what they're doing is what ends up generating muscle growth. So as the nervous system is learning those motor patterns, that is enough stress itself with the, usually with the amount of load that they're using in order to create the need for adaptation at a muscular level. And then after they've been doing that long enough, the only thing really kind of going into an intermediate stage where you have a pretty good grasp and pretty good motor patterns and those kind of things on the list that you're using, the type of periodization just really use, we'll see some type of progressive overload, consistently trying to get more reps with a specific weight or add weight here and there where you can. And once again, I don't feel like even at the intermediate level that it's, oh, you should overly complicate matters because you can focus for a very long time on just getting stronger and you know being able to do more reps with a certain weight or add weight or add reps. And you can focus on those two things for really probably 10 or 15 years. And I think that's a huge part of where a lot of lifters will, when they start to transition from that newbie phase into a more intermediate phase, the gains slow down, right? Because the body is, you know, the, the nervous system has adapted to the, the motor patterns and there's been a lot of adaptation. That's why muscle growth happens so quickly at first. So when that happens, what happens is that gains slow down. The rate of muscle gain is going to slow down because the body doesn't really want to grow muscle. It's just so metabolically expensive, right? It, it, it goes against what it really wants to be able to do. So you have to continue to give it stress that it needs to adapt to in order to continue to grow muscle. But even at the intermediate stage, the need for some high level form of uh, periodization probably isn't necessarily needed. Good programming is clearly going to be needed. And yes, there'll be some need for kind of giving a map. But for example, something like the UP daily undulated periodization for like an intermediate probably is overkill. They don't really, in my opinion, have enough wherewithal to do some type of auto regulation for themselves. So even if it was like an intermediate stage, well, if you were going to use periodization for an intermediate, it would be some type of linear periodization. That would be more applicable to somebody who was an intermediate. And then not, not until you get into a more truly advanced stage where somebody has a feel for their body and their fatigue and how their lifts are going, 
where they could implement some type of auto regulation, which is what DUP requires. And so even in a meta analysis, what we've seen when you look at daily undulated periodization versus linear periodization, there's no one way that's superior than the other when you're talking in terms of inducing hypertrophy. So that part will come back to a lot of personal preference, like a lot of things do in this, these fields, right? We'll come back to what it is that you feel like uh, you enjoy doing best. So if you like, once you become attuned enough into how your body responds or how you're feeling and that kind of stuff, if you like using more auto regulation, then that's going to work. But if you like using a form of linear periodization, which is what I did when I was powerlifting, I really like that because I had landmarks to hit each week. I knew I needed to hit and that kept me very focused. So um, which one are that it's, there's not one that seems to be superior to the other. I think once you, like I said, once you get to an advanced stage, if you want to try some you more auto regulation in your training, that could be helpful. But for me, I still like linear periodization for strength purposes alone because it kept me focused on my goals each week and each mess up cycle. Even when we think about periodization, it's not really needed when it comes to results. It's more like a, a tool that you have in your toolbox to add some variety, more psychological, more psychological. I don't know, entertainment, just because it makes you uh, get out of the routine or I don't know. What do you think about that? The phrase I like to use there is I call it mental mental masturbation. And that is um, a lot of people, what something is like, they try to make auto regulation really complicated by calling it something like daily undulated periodization. So basically what it's just saying is when you go in the gym, if you're really tired, you don't lift as much, or maybe you don't do as many sets, or if you're feeling really good, you go after it a little bit. We don't need to make this super complicated. So that's just what auto-regulation is. Um, and I think that so, people... so auto-regulation means basically that you go to the gym and you get to choose that even though you have a weekly volume, you can still get it done, but you have the flexibility maybe to choose not to do and that I... specific training that day, but you can do it any other day. Yeah, and I, Is that right? I remember, yeah, and if I remember correctly, what they saw over the period, a period of time uh, when, it, when they were looking at DUP versus linear periodization was over the course of time, the volume ended up coming out pretty similar regardless of one or the other, which is why the results ended up being very similar as well. So, again, that's going to come back to personal preference for people. I don't think there's a superior method there. I think the superior method is going to always be the one that you're going to be the most consistent with. And for those who don't know, when you say undulating periodization and linear periodization, what does that mean? Well, linear periodization generally flows along um, weeks at a time where you're, uh, like the type of linear periodization I use was where the intensity, and I'm talking, when I say intensity here, I don't mean effort, I mean the amount of uh, the, basically one rep max. So it's whether it's 70, 80% of your one rep max or whatever. And generally, as the intensity goes up each week, your reps will come down. So that's a type of linear periodization. That's a, very, that's a very common type of linear periodization used in powerlifting. So with daily undulated periodization, it's more about um, being in tune with your body and how much you want to lift for the day and then how many sets you want to do and how many reps you want to do and stuff like that. So there are two very different things. Linear is very rigid. You know, you're going to be doing this way for this many sets, for this many reps, where daily undulated periodization, you're going in and seeing how you feel for the day and basing uh, your training around kind of that in input that you're getting from your body from a, um, you know, from like a biological standpoint. But do you have to have a specific, like, set volume that you want to achieve by the end of the week? So, that you, so then you know well, this is the amount of sets I should be achieving for lower body or upper body. So in this case, even though if I'm not feeling my best today to do this amount of weight or this amount of sets, can I do it tomorrow, but I still meet my, my sort of my goal, that, my targets at the end of the week? That is, to me, like that is so far removed though now from where how I look at training that I don't, like I'm so disconnected from that type of thinking when it comes to training i don't look at sets like that i look at the amount of effective reps that are being performed because mm -hmm. the only thing that matters really in a training session is the amount of stimulus or the type of stimulus that you're going for and that can only be achieved if you're talking from a hypertrophy standpoint with doing a specific amount or doing the enough amount of effective reps that create that need for adaptation from the training session so I don't really look at things like that. I look at things more from what I'm doing in a training session alone and not quite as much um, what I'm doing over the course necessarily every week, although I do have an idea of that. 
but I don't look at things like, um, I don't look at volume a lot of the same ways that other people look at volume. I, look okay. at, I, I pay more attention to how many sets am I doing that actually go towards creating the need for adaptation. And I think that's how everybody that's looking to grow muscle should look at training is how many sets are they going to program for their training cycle that are going to go towards helping them grow? And then how many sets did they perform in that training session that achieve that degree of stimulus? How do you make a rep effective? So uh, the effective rep, the only reps that matter in terms of effectiveness are a certain amount of reps uh, within proximity to failure. So it's postulated that somewhere to the tune of you know, when you train to true failure, you've got about anywhere it's going to be. My researcher, Chris Beersley, says that it's five reps. If you train to true failure, the last five reps are the only reps in that set that contribute to achieving um, a hypertrophy stimulus. So that's within a set taken to failure. I think there's probably something more. I like to have a range more than I like to be so rigid about something. So I think something to the effect of four to six reps so if you performed a five rep max, literally, if you did a set of five, it was like a five rep max, you couldn't do a six rep. Those five reps would all go towards hypertrophy stimulus. If you did a set of 10 and you couldn't do an 11th rep, the last five reps of that set would also count towards hypertrophy stimulus. So the only reps that matter in your workout, if you're trying to grow muscle, are the ones that get close enough to failure to cause that need. So once the fibers detect they've been mechanically loaded, that's what drives muscle growth is mechanical tension. Once the fibers detect they've been mechanical loaded, mechanically loaded, the mechanical transduction kicks off and your body's like, oh, let's kick off some muscle protein synthesis and mTOR and all that kind of stuff and all the good things happen. So without effective reps in a training session, you won't grow. Mm. So I have two follow-up questions about that. One would be, why would you use warm-up, warm-ups first and yeah. then you, you actually do an actual uh, working set? Why, why do you use that approach? You mean like the warm up, warm up approach, and then getting to like the working set, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So if you're doing like squats, you don't actually do use go straight to the working set. You actually do like a pyramid of warm ups, yeah. right. leading to the right working set. Right. Of course. So any time if you're doing a set of squats, um, if you're doing a set of squats, let's say you're going to work up to, let's say I was going to work up to 405 pounds for 10 reps. So the first set might be 135 for like 10, you know, and then the next set might be 225 for like eight. The next set might be 315 for six reps. And then it might be 365 for three or four reps. And then you go to the four, four or five and do your set. So as you add weight, you bring the reps down. You don't want to tire yourself out so much on your warm up sets that by the time that you get to the set that you're going to do, that's going to have those effective reps in it that you've actually fatigued yourself from the warm-up sets. So how much should be in, in the leading up to the actual working set? How, how many reps versus the actual working set? You should be increasing the reps as you go or you go sort of more reps, less reps, less reps as you go increasing your weight leading to the working set? How would you do that sort of programming for the pyramid of warm-ups leading to the, warm, to the actual working set? You mean do, I, do you increase the reps? So how would you do, what, what, does, what do you do in these uh, warm-up sets? Is that uh, maybe you use like less loading, but how many reps do you do for that before you actually get, or oh, not, not counted? Okay, so that, that would be literally, like, that would be a day-to-day -day basis thing. Sometimes I'll need to do more warm-up sets, and sometimes I don't need as many because I get warmed up faster. So there's kind of a combination of feeling like the nervous system is getting warmed up, and then a combination of feeling like the muscle is ready to work too. Um, generally speaking, something like 12 to 15 reps on the very first warm-up set, and then the reps start coming down as I start increasing the load. Okay. And do you need to do that for every single movement that you're going to target, or is this no. maybe the, the more compounds, the first one? Well, it, I mean, it all depends, right? So if you're really strong and you're doing something like squats or deadlifts and you have to work up to 600 pounds, it's, you're going to need to do a lot more warm-up sets. Then if you would say do a set of leg extensions where you might only need two warm-up sets to be ready to go right into the weight that you're going to use. So I don't know why my phone keeps doing that. So um, it all depends on the exercise that you're using. For example, if you're doing side laterals, you won't need to do as many warm-up sets as you would do, say, if you're squatting 600 pounds. So if you're doing side laterals and you're only going to work up to 30-pound dumbbells, 
you might use the tens and then the twenties and then be ready to go to the thirties. So it all is movement dependent um, and it's loading dependent. So there's no one, one formula that you can give that just going to cover you for every exercise. With, with an actual working set, would it be only just one set and the other, the other ones are not counted as that? Or do you do more than one working set? I, the only sets that I quote unquote count are the sets that go towards muscle growth. I don't okay. count. So in a, in a training session, I, when I talk about what, set, what's, what sets count, um, um, if it doesn't go towards, if it doesn't have any effective reps in it, I don't count it. It's just warm-ups, and I don't count warm-ups. Warm-ups do not count as part of your volume. So there was a study done by Han that looked at an enormous amount of squatting and training volume done over the course of six weeks. And there was a very, very limited amount of muscle growth because they kept the, um, the sets that were performed were about four or five reps shy of failure. And this also falls in line with the effective reps theory that you have to be, you're going to get about five reps uh, of growth out of a set taken to failure. So if you're doing, a lot of people get very, very hyper-focused on volume and they don't understand the concept that all the volume in the world will not drive muscle growth if you are not training pretty close to failure or to failure. So there's no point in counting sets that don't have reps in them that don't go towards creating that need for adaptation or don't go towards mechanically loading the muscle. They don't do anything. They just make you fucking tired. <laughs> so... Would you use RPEs or RIRs for that particular, like measuring how close, how many reps in reserve you have? Um, and especially looking at outer regulation, you can, based on how much effort you're putting into each set with your RP. Like if I'm doing an RP9 and I have a RIR of one, so one rep in reserve or two reps right. in reserve. Right, if you were doing RP9, you would have one, R, one RIR. Yeah. For the most part, I don't use, I, and I understand all those concepts and some people like them. I don't. I think it's, it's overly nuanced. If, I, if I'm doing a set, I'm just going to failure. That's pretty much it. Okay. So if I do a set, um, some people will ask about like, well, squats or whatever. Um, for something like squats or certain movements like that, like a leg press or a squat or a remaining deadlift, to me, failure is when you know that you're not going to be able to perform another rep and maintain the degree of execution and mechanics that you had prior to that. So it's like what I call like form failure. Okay. So it's not, if you were squatting, to me, failure, like technically speaking, they say, well, it's to where the muscle can't produce enough force to move the external load anymore. But I don't think you need to do that to mechanically load the muscles properly in a movement like squats, for example, where, you know, if you you're like, when you do a really hard set of squats, you know what a really hard set of squats feels like, right? A really hard set of squats. So I don't feel like that you need to, to go to the point where you literally fall down and can't get back up. So I don't think yes. you need to do that. Though I have done that. When I go and uh, perhaps I do a, a deadlift or a squat, I make sure it's heavy, uh, but I don't, see, I don't see myself doing only five reps. I feel like I, I don't want to get to a point where I, I have to be, that has to be that heavy that I can't compromise my posture or my form, especially right. if I'm not very strong at that movement. But I will aim to get a failure with more reps, like yep. uh, at least I am for 12 or 15. Would that still count if you do more reps and still get to failure? Yeah, that's what I said earlier. Was if you do 10 reps and you go to failure, you still end up with the same amount of effective reps that you got as if you did a five rep max. So a 10 rep max and a five rep max are going to pr both produce the same amount of effective reps in terms of stimulating muscle growth. Okay. So as long when you're training to failure, you end up pretty close with the same amount of reps that go towards stimulating muscle growth and mechanically loading those muscle fibers. But you don't want to either go like extremely too much. Like even if you like to do junk volume, for example, if you do a thousand reps, you still get to failure, but you did so much reps. So, so, right. Would that count? No. Yeah. So it would count. So like what we've seen also through enough, enough research now is that um, if you're training either to failure, close enough to failure, the amount of reps you perform, there's no different outcome in terms of hypertrophy. So they, they looked at sets of six versus sets of 10 versus sets of 20 versus sets of 50. They all produce similar, the almost exact same amounts of muscle growth. And that is because you end up mechanically loading the muscle fiber similarly okay. if you're training to failure. It doesn't matter if it's 30 reps or 20 reps or 10 reps or whatever. The, the fibers get mechanically loaded all the same for probably about the same number of reps. So that should make sense. 
how what becomes efficient and that's what i was the point i was trying to get back to that you were talking about there the reason why i think that bodybuilder style reps which is where you're doing somewhere between eight to 12 reps in a set has become kind of the standard for bodybuilders is because it's that happy medium where you're not training so heavy that the passive and connective tissue is taking a beating and your joints get beat up but also that you can maintain your degree of execution and mechanics in a, in a movement um and the other one is that you're not doing so many reps that it becomes metabolically taxing. So you end up with this butt ton of metabolic stress, which is very, you know, it's, it's very hard. You end up with a lot of lactic acid and things like that, that you're having to battle through in order to just get to the point of fatiguing that muscle. So that's very metabolically expensive. You go through a lot of glycogen, you have the lactic acid buildup. Um, and I also think there's probably a higher degree of oxidative stress that happens when you do that type of training than when you're doing training in that six, eight, 10, 12 rep range. So the reason why that's kind of become the quote unquote magical rep range is because of that reason is it kind of that happy medium. It's not so heavy that you're going to get beat up and it's not um, so many that you end up, you know, with an enormous amount of oxidative stress. It's also harder to recover nervous system wise. It's harder to recover from very high rep sets. A lot of people think that heavy training is hard on the nervous system, but it's the opposite. It's actually the really high rep. And we see that with, um, Anything that's highly repetitive has a lot of repetitions, for example, like endurance work is actually harder to recover from from a nervous system standpoint than something that's lower rep. So the powerlifters have often thought, oh, well, something that's really heavy for two or three or four reps is hard on your nervous system. It's the other way. It's the stuff that's 20 and 30 and 40 reps that's actually more difficult to recover from a nervous system standpoint. Would it be preferred to go for a leg press for hypertrophy compared to a squat uh, so you can get more effective reps without from failure? Um, I would approach that in terms of picking movements that um, are going to be best for your structure. But the one thing I like about, I don't really, um, if we're talking pure hypertrophy, the way that I base the movements are, do they fit your structure? Can you execute them well? And the other thing is like, do they have a high degree of, um, of stability and bracing? So something like a leg press or something like a hack squat, those are usually better hypertrophy movement selections because of the fact that you do have more bracing and stability, especially from an external standpoint. So when you do a leg press, you have stability based on the seat you're sitting in, right? This external stability for your hips, for your back. But when you're, when you're squatting with a bar with free weights, you have to create that stability internally, right? So you're limited, the amount of force production that the quadriceps or the glutes or whatever that you're trying to train, whatever tissue you're trying to, to train, is going to be limited by the amount of stability that you can actually provide internally. But when you're on a leg press or hack squat, you have the external stability. So you can actually produce more force by the working muscles. When the higher force production there is, then the more growth that we're going to get out of the muscle as well. Mm, that's very interesting. All right, there you go. You have your answer. Okay, now let me ask you one question that is, I was very interested to ask you. And what for you is functional training? Because a lot of people think that functional training is jump on a stability ball or an impossible ball and do exercise of balance or doing one arm and then doing another thing. Right. What functional training is for you? Okay, so training is always, there's a set principle, right? A specific adaptation to impose demands. Whatever it is that you keep asking your body to get better at, it's going to get better at. I can't think of a single sport or anything that we do on an unstable surface. So the idea that training on unstable surfaces makes us more functional doesn't make any fucking sense at all. So it, this is how I view functionality. If I get stronger in the gym and if I get stronger quadriceps from doing a leg press, and that means that I have stronger legs, stronger legs are functional. <laughs> There's no way around that. The, um, I don't like stability ball training. I don't like um, unstable training. People will talk like that's how I use terms like say, oh, there's a high degree of activation. But what they understand is that activation, that's not activation and output are two very different things. So when we're doing movements that require a lot of balance and require a lot of that internal stability, like I talked about, the muscles can't produce as much force. OK, so when I have a muscle that can't produce as much force, what is it trying to do? What it's trying to do is help stabilize that joint. So am I training to create my muscles so that they just learn how to stabilize like the joint? Like they already know how to do that. The nervous system already knows how to do that effectively. What I want to do is make sure that the joint is stable during training so that the muscles can produce as much force as possible. OK, so that's how I'm going to get stronger. That's how I'm going to grow larger. And that's going to have transferability out into real life, because if I'm bigger and stronger in the gym, that is functional. And all of my life, I've never met a big, strong dude in the gym who couldn't open a pickle jar. So I just, that's just tends to be how it works. 
I guess functional training or like working with unstable surface um, are more ad addressed to people that are doing rehab for a specific reason, but not necessarily to get stronger or be better at doing certain lifts. I think that's where it becomes more handy these were functional and using a stable surface. But I guess functional training comes down to what is applicable to a daily life routine as well. Like if you do but a squat. I think that's a misconception too because all of the movements that we do in the gym, right, all of those movements are just, they can be corrective movements if they're performed effectively and in the right way. Yeah. So you don't need to do these really weird um, esoteric exercises where you're balancing on shit. And think about it. Okay, so if you get injured and you go into the physical therapist's office and he's got you balancing on some ball or doing a bunch of unstable exercises, like, did, were you doing that? Are you going to go back into life and start doing that stuff now? Were you not able to do it before? But if he simply strengthens the muscle and the muscle oh, yeah. is now stronger than it was before it got injured, then you're going to have a stronger muscle to work with and you're going to be less likely to get injured. So once again, it comes back to, am I creating an environment where the muscle can produce as much force as possible because the joint is stable while I'm trying to ask it to do that? So creating yeah. these environments where I'm working through a high degree of instability doesn't make a lot of sense to me because it doesn't, you don't allow the muscles to say, hey, I want to produce a lot of force. They're saying, hey, let me try to stabilize this joint a whole lot. But that's not how we get muscles maximally stronger. And even if you're rehabbing, you want to strengthen that muscle. I agree. Yeah get into nutrition so i'm very interested in going through these questions with you just because um, i want to see your approach and your stance on certain things one of them was uh, body recomposition based on personal experience what is your stance or your thoughts on that in training individuals yes so what i've seen over the years and there's a little bit of research to support this is that even in um you know, people who are slightly advanced, there can be a degree of muscle gain while fat loss is occurring, but they're not very significant, right? And that's what a lot of people ask is the, the people have this belief that you can grow muscle and lose fat at the same time. It can happen in small degrees, even in more advanced people. It happen, can happen in larger degrees for true newbies and novices, right? But uh, from a state of when we talk about recomposition, right, better recomposition generally means that we have more muscle and less body fat. So... The, to me, the best way to approach that usually is to start at the determination of where you're at right now, where you want to get to, and what's going to be the first step that you need in, in that process. So for some people, it's going to be dieting first. And I would say for the, over the years, the large majority of people that I've worked with usually had some extra fat that they needed to get off. Because when you're leaner, you have much better nutrient partitioning. You're much more insulin sensitive. You're much more likely to store the nutrients that you do have coming out inside the muscle cell. Uh, and what I have found that are people who are tend to be like fatter, you know, they're probably carrying too much body fat. Um, it becomes very easy for those people. Um, they usually have a pattern of eating that they need to reconfigure at that point. But also, um, when you're when you when you're carrying more body fat, fat cells are both more estrogenic and more um, inflammatory. So a huge part of uh, being able to improve that nutrient partitioning is lowering the amount of inflammation that you're dealing with every day too, right? Because <clears throat> inflammation it makes you more insulin resistant. And if we want to get better at creating muscle, we need to be insulin sensitive. Insulin isn't responsible for making us fatter, too many calories are. But if you want to grow muscle as easily and as efficiently as possible, you do want your insulin to be, you want to be insulin sensitive, right? So usually the first step in terms of a good body recomposition process is going to be getting the person lean first so that they're, they're, uh, they have better nutrient partitioning and then working from an area where they don't get overly fat again while they're trying to gain muscle. How would you do that? Would you um, implement a lean, a lean bulk? Uh, would you just aim for a combination of uh, slowly – adding extra calories as you go through and increasing volume uh, so or like working load so you actually I kind of compensate? Ever, well, from a training standpoint, I don't, I don't believe in cutting routines or bulky routines. Whatever training stimulus can build muscle will be a, a sufficient or efficient for retaining muscle while you're dieting. So nothing in terms – I don't use um, – extra activity in the gym, um, cardio is always a, a, a variable that you can manipulate. But from a gym standpoint, whatever you're doing that you can grow muscle with, you'll be able to retain muscle with. So I always look at 
your biggest weapon in fat loss is going to be the amount of calories that you have coming in. It's far easier to not eat 900 calories than to burn 900 calories doing some type of cardio. So the elimination of too many calories is going to be the first step. And then the addition and looking at, you know, you have to look at a multitude of other factors. There's no one way for everybody. If somebody has a highly um, active job, you're not going to throw cardio at that person. If they're naturally getting an X amount of steps in per day, you know, 15 or 20,000 steps, I have clients like that. So I don't give them cardio. I just adjust their diet. Um, but if you have somebody that's got a more sedentary position, they might get a lot of cardio. So there's, there's kind of too many variables there to say, here's the way to do that. And it's always looking at the individual and their lifestyle and what it is that, um, that they're going to have preferences for. So there's a multitude of factors that comes in those variables. How lean do you think should a female and a male be, be prior to actually focusing on building muscle? If you want them to be lean, how yeah. lean should they be? Um, for males, I think I don't think that you should be looking at um, trying to get into a real mass gaining cycle till you're at least at 10% body fat. I actually like guys to be leaner because um, I like you to have some wiggle room in there, right? For females, something like 15 to 17% to get it, at least get into that range first. So I like for people to be lean enough. Uh, guys, like I said, something at 10 or a little bit below, maybe 8 to 10%, and females probably 15 to 17%. Um, and most people don't understand as they go through that process, it's highly likely that you do not have as much muscle mass as you think you do. Because everybody I've ever gotten lean that's ever gotten lean before is always very surprised at how little they weigh by the time they get very lean. So, and that's always kind of a shock to their system because, you know, they've gotten compliments about how big they are, how jacked they are, whatever they are. And then we get them lean and they can't believe they weigh so little. So most people don't have anywhere near as much muscle mass as they think they do once that fat starts coming off. And that's kind of a hard lesson uh, that people have to learn when they're going through a recomposition process. So when you're trying to lean someone out to perhaps a lower body fat, how do you normally determine in your experience how long someone should be diet for to get to from this level of body fat to that level of body fat? How, how would you determine that in, in your case? And again, that comes back to the, um, to the individual. There's people that have started dieting, you know, that were, you know, 100 pounds overweight and dieted right into a physique show. So it really comes back to the individual, um, what their goals are and those kind of things. Again, I, there's, no, there's no right or wrong answer here. When I started, when I retired from powerlifting, I was almost 290 pounds and I dieted for two years right into a bodybuilding show. <laughs> So it wasn't my plan to do a bodybuilding show because I started probably for the first, well, it wasn't two years, it was a year and a half. But for the first year, I was just doing a steady diet. And then I had a buddy who was like, you should do a show. And then a couple of months went by and I was still dieting and still losing fat. So I just went from 290 and dieted all the way into my show. So it really depends on the goals of the individual because the only times that you should probably, in my opinion, take a true dieting break is when you're getting to those extreme levels, low levels of body fat, like in physique composition of some type. And I'm talking about either women's figure or physique or men's bodybuilding, that kind of stuff, men's classic or that, those kind of things. Those really super low levels of body fat um, are unhealthy, clearly, and they're not sustainable. So those types would deserve diet breaks. But if you're dieting down, and here's the thing that a lot of people don't get. It's, it, to me, it's never ending. So there's no end. Like you just, if you arrive at 10% body fat, then there's going to be a certain amount of upkeep, both in your diet and your training and your cardio that you're going to have to do to maintain that. So mm. to believe that you can say, okay, well, I'm here now. Okay, well, I've arrived. Well, if you don't want to maintain that, then sure, just go back to doing whatever you were doing before and you'll lose all of it. And you'll be like, wow, why did I do that? But if you're going to get to a certain level of condition and you want to maintain that level of condition, then there's a lot of upkeep that comes with it. And this is kind of yeah. the part about the fitness industry, I think that bothers me sometimes just because I don't think that message is clear enough. It, there's no finish line. There's no finish line. There's no, you don't, in my opinion, even if you arrive, there's work that you still have to wake up and do each day if you want to maintain that. It, it's not free at that point. You only earn right. getting to that point. If you want to earn staying there and keeping what it is that you accomplish, there's still daily work that has to be done. You just don't get to throw it all away. So that is just kind of how I look at that. I believe that this idea gets kind of, programmed into people depending on all the message they're getting is that they're going to arrive 
and then they can just go back to living their life like they want to, which they can, but they don't get to keep that level of conditioning and that look and that amount of muscle mass. Think of it this way. You spent 20 years building up the amount of muscle mass that you wanted to have, and you wake up one day and you have it, and then you decide, oh, well, I don't have to work out anymore. This muscle mass is just going to stay here. Well, no, the hell it's not. Like, you still got to get up and go to the gym. You still got to train. Well, if you get to your guy and you get to, you know, 9% or 8% or 7% body fat or whatever. And let's say you say, well, I want to stay at 8% body fat, which is doable. That's doable. I think that some people like 8% for a guy, you can maintain, you can maintain that. That is perfectly maintainable for some guys, but not if you don't do the work required to maintain it. And you got to sacrifice a lot of things. Correct. So it all comes back to what it is that you want and what it is that you're willing to give up to either get it or maintain it. Same when it comes to like deciding if you wanted to do a contest prep, why do you actually want to do that? Because sometimes people don't think about what they, how much they need to commit to that and how, many, uh, how much of sacrifices they have to put into, into the game to get there. If you want to be lean, just don't, you don't have to go into a contest prep just a, as a way of motivation because are, there's a, a wrong mindset to, do, to go about it. When you're talking about dieting, there needs to be clear context about what we're talking about here. If you're just talking about losing some weight or fat loss, then the amount of restrictions that you may have to implement may not be that many, right? Like if you just need to get a calorie deficit, there may not be a whole lot of restrictions. The more extreme that you want to get with your fat loss, the more restrictions are going to come into place. And then the more fine details matter too. Like we talked about earlier, and you said, well, nutrient timing doesn't matter. But it does more so when you get super lean like that, nutrient timing or nutrient timing may matter a whole lot if you're training fasted, right? So it depends on the context of how we're talking about a particular dietary approach. So when we're talking about getting like super like peeled, like low single digits um, for men or like high single digits for women, there's a lot of restrictions that come to get there. And usually they have to happen for a long period of time. So, but if you're just talking about losing fat, sure, just get the calorie deficit and see that calorie deficit out until you hit some plateaus and then create a little bit more of a deficit, so forth and so on, until you get to where you want to be. But the contest, um, contest diet, like prep, that type of dieting is a complete, it's apples and monkey wrenches compared to just dieting to, to lose some weight and get healthy and lose fat. Absolutely. Have you ever met or have clients that, especially women that get so low in body fat, they can keep it for a long time without having repercussions on their menstrual cycle, for example? Um, generally speaking, when, yeah, when women get low enough, right, when their body fat gets low enough, they just lose their menstrual cycle, right? Um, for some of them, they're really happy about that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I've had that with, um, with women clients. That's another one of the side effects, right, of, um, of contest diving for women is losing that menstrual cycle. Um, the other one is, you know, is the, the lack of sleep that you end up getting because cortisol levels are very high during that time. Um, you know, there's a multitude of negative side effects that come with that type of dieting. Again, that's why that's not really sustainable. But some people are going to be naturally a lot leaner than other people, right? And they don't have to do quite as much. You know, that's why I said try to – to give this cookie cutter approach, especially when it comes to dieting, um, you know, that's not a good idea because what ever, we all have different levels of muscle mass. We all have different metabolisms. We all have a multitude of um, things that are unique to us from a biological physiological standpoint that allow us to either, we are going to need more restrictions or less restrictions. It's like um, me and Jordan, I had talked about this past week on his podcast, I can't do flexible dieting. I can't do, if it fits your macros, I can't eat one cookie. If I eat a cookie, I'm going to eat 42 cookies right after that. That's just how I work. And you had one of your questions was talking about, you know, me meeting the 90% rule. I mean, he and I talked about that. Like he can do that. Jordan can do, uh, if it fits your macros, he can do a flexible approach every day. And I'm like, I can't do that, man. I crush my diet six days a week and then have my cheat meal that I'm looking forward to on Friday. And I love it. I do great with that. Like, it's great for me. Jordan said he could never do that. He said he would hate his life. But I could never do it the way he does it. It's okay. two different approaches. And it's two different, very different physiological, you know, ecosystems, right? You know, like Jordan's like, you know, two feet tall and he's like 150 pounds. You know, I'm like six feet and 250 pounds. So my approach and his approach 
uh, physiologically is different, but also the mental and emotional aspect approaches are so important too, right? Because writing a diet out or just giving somebody a diet, that's easy. Like it's a very simple thing. You put them in a calorie deficit. So you make sure you figure out a number and you give them food that equals out to that many calories based on a certain macronutrient preference, right? But the truth is there's an emotional aspect involved in eating and dieting. And that can't be overlooked. I can't do it if it fits your macros approach. Jordan can't do my approach. So it's up to us as individuals to find what sustainability is, is what we can do and enjoy ourselves and our life each and every day, right? That's the sustainable part is that I have enjoyment. I have a tremendous amount of enjoyment out of the way that I do my process. Somebody else might look at that and go, that sucks, that's restrictive. I don't feel restricted at all. I get leaner every week. My training is still good. I feel sexy as fuck. That's all I care about, right? So I don't like, I don't care about having a cookie during the week. I'm gonna get as many cookies as I want on Friday night. I'm gonna get as much cake as I want on Friday night. And for me, that approach works. I don't feel deprived. It's absolutely very sustainable for me. But everybody, it's up to everybody to figure out those little tweaks that they can make in their diet that does allow them to wake up every day and not feel like they're a slave to the grind or they're a slave that they're encased in this mentality of I can't have, I can't have. I never feel like that. I always feel like I can have. But what I want the most is, is I want those other things. So it always comes back to that. Like, right, what I said, what is it that you want the most and what is it that you're willing to give up for it? And some people are like, I want to lose weight, but I don't want to give up being able to have a cookie or a piece of cheesecake here today. I'm like, that's cool, man. As long as you're meeting that calorie deficit or whatever that you need to lose weight, right? And you're not picking foods that are trigger foods that cause you to go off the rails, then do that. I can't do that. So I don't. But those are the things people have to figure out on their own. There's no textbook for that. So you pretty much individualize. Whoever needs to have that approach, if it's fixed your macros or flexible dieting, they can go that, that path because that's going to create adherence and consistency for them to reach their goals. But right. the, what, what are you saying is that in your case, uh, it is more something that you're, you're happy to go black and white from Monday to Friday, very low calories. I am happy to eat this not very much uh, variety. But on my weekends, I'm going to get the hell out of it and enjoy everything well, that I just, can. Just, just my Friday night. But like for me, I love it. I enjoy it. My Friday night is so fun. I have it with, you know, my daughter, Naomi. And it's like such a fun process for us. And during the week, I'm focused. You know, I have my training and I cry every day. I crush like my dietary like goals, which is just to be 100% compliant. That's me. I want to be 100% compliant. And so I get up and I crush my dietary goals every day. I do my work. Everything feels very ordered to me. So then by the time that Friday comes around, I'm like, man, I'm ready. Let's do this. Right. And, what, and do you do that just one meal? And do you actually sort of track it? So, you know, no. roughly or no, I, no. No, that would defeat. We, I talked about this with Jordan. That would defeat the whole purpose. There, there's the emotional aspect of the cheat meal for, for me is that I'm getting to, I'm not counting calories in the cheat meal. I don't care. There's, there's definitely some, um, there's some strategy to it. It's foods that I digest well and I, I assimilate and digest well that I don't have a problem with that. Um, it's also usually way higher in carbs um, because I'm more depleted by the time that Friday rolls around. And those are some of the things from a strategical standpoint that I do use. But I would never count those freaking calories. So like that, that to me would remove the whole enjoyment of it because that is supposed to be the break that I have from the diet here. Right. That's the emotional and mental break that I have. I get to enjoy life again. So if I was counting the calories in that meal, that would remove that that for me. And it would just make it another meal. I don't want to count the calories in it. I have counted them before a couple of times. It's usually about seven to eight thousand calories. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a lot. Yeah. But it's, I, it's my question would be my, my question quickly would be, do you do you sort of eat until you're about to explode or are you sort of very intuitive with your with your, like, if you're full, you stop or like, no, no. I need to keep going. What, what, what do you do? Um, I, I tell us, tell us Jordan, his podcast, the meal's not over when I'm full. The meal's over when I hate myself. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I don't, I don't, um, here's the thing. It's really important that I carve up as much as possible in that meal because there's going to be a leptin spike that I get over the next few days. So I'm not really hungry. Right. So that's part of the strategy too. So usually by Saturday and Sunday, I'm even sometimes Monday, I'm not hungry at all. Um, 
And then the other part is that I have as much glycogen replenishment as possible. I usually see a, usually a, a good jump in performance by about Monday in my training from that meal. But what happens if I start to lay this out for you, it'll start to make sense. Because of that leptin spike, um, I don't start getting hungry again usually until Tuesday or Wednesday. So when you think about it, I only feel like I'm dieting maybe part of Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then I get to cheat on Friday. So I only have about three days during the week where I'm kind of hungry. Okay. I feel like, do you see what I'm saying? So yeah. a lot of people don't understand this strategy. So for me, I feel like I'm dieting fewer days during the week than most people because I eat so much. It's so important that I get so much food in on that meal that I have a nice left in spike. I'm not hungry for a couple of days at all, and I have good energy. So I'm only kind of tired and hungry for maybe two and a half to three and a half days of the week. And the good thing that for, for what I'm getting from you is that you're actually – being able to, that helps you a lot to control the rest of the days and boost your, your training uh, in a way that you can actually see the benefit of doing that. And as you say, it's not like a full day. It's just one meal. It's just, and it's just, uh, it? it's just my Friday night meal with my movies. That's it. That's it. So grateful that you came with me to this is live. Yeah. I had a lot of fun. Um, yeah. Enjoyed a lot asking you so many of these questions of training and um, I, I, feel, couldn't, I, I like couldn't be great. I feel like you have a, a thousand more questions you want to keep asking me. <laughs> no, but I think we, we did cover quite a few that I really wanted to just make sure we had it, cover it, and I really am thank, th very thankful for that. Absolutely, and I, I love your content. You're awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate you. So I have a thousand more questions that I can go through that would be very <laughs> fun to go through. Uh, yep, have, let's do it again. Just peel out your questions next time, and we'll just do a continuation. Sounds good. Bye-bye, Paul. Bye.